Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Loki Season 2, Episode 5, Science Fiction. The season's penultimate episode that lets go of the science and embraces the narrative fiction of giving your hero a purpose to be a pen in a mug. From real-world Alcatraz mysteries to the possibility that Loki could have actually invented the TVA, and B-15 confirmed as Verity Willis, let's break down all the Easter eggs and amazing attention to detail in this episode. By the way, it means so much to me that you watch these every week and you're getting as much out of the series as I am. You can tell from my bloodshot eyes I am recording this late after watching the episode, but if it freaks you out, just like uh, cover your eyes until uh, an asset covers me. Like, uh, <laughs> see? You can't see my eyes at all. Anyway, thank you, thank you, thank you for watching. Oh, by the way, I am wearing our OB inspired shirt. We're all gonna die! I think it's my favorite shirt that we've ever released and really it's the best way to support us by grabbing one of these. You can get it at nerdriot.shop and if you're in the LA area, we are doing a live show on Thursday, November 16th at Brain Dead Studios. Come hang out with me, with Tommy, with others from the New Rockstars team. I'm gonna have to face the music for thinking that Mobius was McDonald's Jack or theorizing that the TVA has got some soil and green operation going on. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Come hang out with us. Okay, we open the episode with the Marvel Studios fanfare with these odd sounds playing over it. Now, last week, composer Natalie Holt tweeted that for episode four, she used whispers and vocal chants from the old Norse poetic Edda Lokasena. The Lokasena features Loki, the mythological Loki, accusing the gods of moralistic sexual impropriety, sorcery, and bias, which he believes will lead to the onset of Ragnarok. But at the start of this episode, it's Loki who finds himself on the other side of an apocalyptic event left behind, alone at the TVA, as if on the other side of a rapture. Episode four ended with Loki getting flooded in light from the wall of the temporal radiation rushing toward the loom observation deck, but episode five opens in the same moment with Loki's eyes opening and Tom Hiddleston's blue eyes looking way greener than usual. While the temporal loom looks pretty messy on the left side here, it is not nearly as chaotic as it was at the end of episode four. Remember then, the right side of the loom was completely unraveled, but here, the right side looks pretty tightly braided to the immediate right of the ring, at least for a bit until it starts to unravel further down on the right side. So we're not at the exact moment of the meltdown, we are before it. But where is everyone? Well, they call this TVA code 1229 fail safe mode. So when the loom fails and temporal radiation swamps the TVA, I think what this means is the TVA automatically reverts all employees back to their branch timelines and freezes this facility in a moment just before the meltdown gets really bad as it undergoes a rebooting process, which would require everything to spaghettify. I think this is just part of the TVA's programming. Why does the TVA need to do this? It's kind of like the blue screen of death, your fail safe mode on your computer. You know it's done so at that point. This is also that the TVA can get rebooted and start over. The variants are reverted to their branch timelines, and yes, we see that each of those four are on branched timelines allowed to exist temporarily like external hard drives waiting to be plugged back into a future iteration of the TVA. But why was Loki left behind here in this rapture? I believe Loki as a variant to Sylvie represents a kind of glitch in the matrix that is linked with Sylvie's possession of He Remains Master Tempad. Loki's time slipping, I believe, is connected to her having that object. As OB later says, It's like you're a better version of one of those Tempads. A better version of one of those Tempads is what He Remains had. The end credits of every episode is on that thing. And I think that's why when Sylvie shoved Loki out of the Citadel in season one, episode six, Loki inadvertently time slipped to an earlier era of the TVA when we started in season two, episode one. And a big clue from the writers later in this episode points to that device being the key to everything. We get a few match cuts of Loki walking through the TVA, kind of lost, and he's always center frame on the cut, almost like a time slip that happens without the slipping part of it. It's just on the cut. And even though Loki is headed in the opposite direction from the automat, we next cut to him walking through the automat doors to find an empty automat, and all of the cases that used to be lit up with slices of key lime pie are now all empty and dark. I kind of feel like we're watching Danny on the big wheel going through the Overlook Hotel. He just kind of cuts from the kitchen basement level to suddenly being in the hallway with the Grady twins. It's all very creepy. Loki hears this announcement. TVA code 1229. 
The weird thing here is that it has this theremin music playing underneath it, recalling the similar music playing under the Miss Minutes welcome video. Like, why would they announce it at all if the whole point is for people not to be in the TVA? Who is this for? I think it really is just part of the programming, and the TVA just kind of runs on these weird, pointless courtesies. So Loki time slips into a chrono monitor bay and sees another version of himself flipping through the TVA handbook, and then time slips again, and we realize he's just back a few minutes because he returns to the bay to find himself now reading the handbook, and the version of himself that he just was is now behind him. So we are seeing a little old bootstrap paradox tie itself into a knot here, and I love it. Upon hearing his past self call out hello before disappearing, our Loki still looks around confused and is like, hello? It just kind of shows how sad and lonely this Loki is. He just wants someone to be in the room with him. But it doesn't last long because the whole Chrono Monitor Bay spaghettifies. And actually listen closely to the sound. <laughs> Yeah, maybe the reason The Shining was in my head is that we hear these weird screams mixed into the sounds that sounds like the unnerving shrieks that we hear over the opening titles of The Shining. And since what is spaghettifying are these control panels, the strands take on a variety of colors to match the wiring inside of those panels. Then the TV monitor spaghettifies, cracking the screen as it switches to a depiction of Miss Minutes saying, thank you for your service before it switches off. Again, a pointless courtesy. Who is this for? Now, the opening Loki title does something different this week. While the letters flicker through different typefaces, the L disappears, and then the K disappears, and then the I, and then leaves the O by itself. And then all four letters appear again, but it mirrors how Loki gets left behind by his friends, but then reunites with them by the end of this episode. But onto my favorite reveal this week, that Casey originated as Frank Morris, Alcatraz inmate AZ-1441, who famously escaped from Alcatraz prison, the island in San Francisco Bay in June 1962, along with Clarence Anglin and John Anglin, using paper mache dummy heads in their beds. The three climbed down ventilation ducts that they carved into their cell walls and then went through an unused utility corridor and then were able to get off the island with an inflatable raft and they were never found. They were believed to have drowned, but there's been a lot of public speculation that they got away. So like the DB Cooper incident in season one, I love that Loki season two brought up a real life mystery and justified it as an extraction variant. And maybe I'm just obsessed with this because I live in San Francisco. I see Alcatraz every day. And just six weeks ago, I visited Alcatraz prison and I went on the audio tour where they walk you through how Frank Norris and how the Anglins broke out. Frank Morris had actually previously escaped from the Louisiana State Penitentiary and had an IQ of 133. So that could explain why Casey is so into the TVA guidebook. Frank Morris ended up in Alcatraz for theft. And it's just worth noting that Casey had been keeping a drawer full of treasures in the TVA, though he considered most of those treasures, junk, and paperweights. Attention to detail on this prison break is so great. The paper mache head in the beds, the tiny, tiny cell, the hole that they carved into the walls ventilation shaft, the boat horn that you hear from outside, and the Golden Gate Bridge in the distance. And his conspirators, Clarence Anglin and John Anglin, are actually cameos by Aaron Moorhead and Justin Benson, who directed this episode and other episodes of Loki Season 2. They and Eric Martin and Kazar Farhani are mostly to thank for this season of content being so good. So Casey slash Frank tells them, Frank, go! Hurry up! If they catch us, they're gonna cut us like fish! Ah, it's a callback to season one, episode one, when Loki threatened Casey. Give me the Tesseract or I'll gut you like a fish, Casey. What's a fish? Which at the time seems like a reference to the movie Scream when the killer told another character named Casey, you hang up on me again, I'll gut you like a fish, understand? But we see that Loki has time slipped onto this beach, and they ask if he's the boat guy. And Casey slash Frank says that he's in the wrong place. They could be referring to the fourth conspirator of the June 1962 Alcatraz escape, a guy named Alan West, who had failed to escape and remained on the island. Or it could be that the way these three escaped is that they could have synced up with an actual boat from the mainland who would have picked them up from their raft and taken them to Angel Island, which is where they were intending to go. So from here, Loki slips to the McDonald's parking lot in Broxton, Oklahoma, 1982, and then the parking lot of a Piranha Power Sports where Mobius works, and we later find out that's the year 2022, where we'll come back to later. But it might be just a coincidence, but it is worth noting that four of these characters have origin years ending in two. Casey's 
1962, Sylvie's in 1982, B-15's in 2012, and Mobius is in 2022. Obi kind of spoils it by being in 1994. Loki then briefly time slips to Time Theater 2-5. It's a large 2, small 5. This episode is Season 2, Episode 5, so mm, there's that. But more importantly, this is the Time Theater where Mobius first interrogated Loki in Season 1. It's where Mobius showed Loki the film reel of his life on the Sacred Timeline, where Loki was sobered by seeing the deaths of Frigga and Odin and himself. It's a hugely important location for Loki on his journey. It's where Mobius gave him a second chance to have a new glorious purpose. As Loki says later, You saw something in me that I hadn't seen in myself. And we know from trailer footage that some emotional gut punch scene is gonna take place here in the finale episode. So next we see B-15's origin as a Dr. Willis, pediatrician in New York, New York in 2012. And in the closing credits, in her file, we see a photocopy of her ID confirming her full name as Verity Willis, pediatrician. And just to verify that this isn't a random thing, we also see on that ID the name of her father, Roger Willis. This is a huge confirmation. Verity Willis comes from the agent of Asgard run of the Loki comics in 2014, Verity Willis is part of a family that includes her father, Roger Willis, that was tasked with guarding the Casket of Ancient Winters and the Anvaranat, which is a magical ring that allows the wearer to see through any lie. But when Verity was a baby, she eats this ring, it dissolves in her stomach, it gives her powers, and later as an adult, she meets Loki while speed dating, and Verity is really the only character who can put Loki in his place. So this is perfect for B-15. It would make sense why she's such a damn good hunter and why that she knows this girl with the cast is probably going to keep climbing trees. Do I think the character that Wunmi Masaku played in the Sacred Timeline dissolved an Asgardian ring in her tummy? No, probably not, but I think it is the spirit of the character that they're trying to say is what B-15 is. Now, again, we're in New York City in 2012 in the MCU. Uh, don't you think it's inevitable that we would hear explosions or Chitauris yelling at each other or Leviathans flying overhead? This would be prime season for Battle in New York. Every other time we go to New York, New York in 2012, we're gonna hear some boom booms at some point. We do not see or hear the battle here, but we are in a branch timeline. It could be a branch where the battle never happened. I think it is though, and we're gonna end up back in that battle and Verity Willis is gonna do something awesome to help people during it. It's just pretty funny that B-15 slash Verity Willis would have been impacted by a citywide crisis caused by Loki and that after she got pruned, she was the arresting officer of Loki variant L-1130 immediately after he escaped from the Avengers after that battle and she got to smack him across the face. Dr. Willis says, do you remember how bad it hurt when you came in? That's good too. Yeah, she tells the girl that pain can actually be a good thing because it teaches you how to avoid danger in the future. It's something B-15 applies to Loki when she arrests him, slowing down that smack so that Loki feels the pain every nanosecond of it. But remember later in season one, when Sylvie meets with B-15 in the rain outside the rocks guard store and shows B-15 her memories, B-15 cries. And now we know it's because she's a doctor and she's probably thinking about all the kids she wasn't around to care for. B-15 slash Dr. Willis writes on the girl's cast, don't climb trees, and then she just realizes that's not gonna stop you, is it? The image of climbing trees also showed up in TVA propaganda posters as a metaphor for pruning branches of the sacred timeline. So we cut to Mobius, AKA Don, finally on a personal watercraft, but just kinda. He's not riding a jet ski, it is a sea do recalling his line to X5 that not all personal watercraft are jet skis. Now it is interesting how Mobius remembers jet skis as a TVA agent, but Casey didn't remember what a fish was, despite despite paddling out across the San Francisco Bay. So Mobius is in Cleveland, Ohio, 2022 branch timeline. 2022 would be four years into the blip if the blip is part of this branch. But you know what? It sounds like a great time for people to escape their stressful life riding around on a sea dew on one of the many lakes, rivers, and ponds in the state of Ohio. I don't know why people think they have to live by an ocean to have a jet ski. Anywhere where there's like a retention pond of water runoff from the rain, you can have a jet ski. There's places in Nevada where you can have a jet ski. Jet ski is an American dream, Friends, shut up. Now, this dirt bike enthusiast who clearly just wanted a free donut is played by Isaac Bauman, who's credited as the cinematographer for Loki season two episodes one, three, four, and this one, five. Between this cameo and Benson and Moorhead playing the Alcatraz guys, it seems like they gave these speaking roles to crew close to production, maybe to avoid actors being cast in these roles and listing them on their IMDb's, which could spoil it ahead of the season. That does often happen. Loki time slips directly in front of the balloon guy, matching his goofy arm waving. You can find old set video of 
when they shot this with Tom Hiddleston, and it's pretty funny. Lover Boys, working for the weekend, plays on the radio, and we learn that Don is a single dad with two sons. A single dad? During the blip, maybe his wife dusted in the snap. Or maybe she fell off the back of the sea dew and he never turned around because he was having too much fun. But remember, Mobius got really defensive in episode two when Brad brought up the possibility that there were people Mobius left behind on the sacred timeline. And even though he probably didn't remember his kids, maybe deep down he had a fatherly instinct and a kind of guilt that had been haunting him. So we got to a bookstore in Pasadena in 1994 where a book titled The Zartan Contingent is on the shelf. And it's written by A.D. Doug, PhD, KQB Self-Publishing. We have seen the Zartan Contingent in the closing credits of every episode, its name could be a reference to G.I. Joe, where Zartan is a villain and mercenary who serves as a leader of the Dreadnoughts and works for Cobra Commander. He's a shapeshifter, capable of changing his skin to blend in, but also in Marvel, there is an ancient alien race of shapeshifters called the Zartans with an X. Other books visible on the shelf, Atlas of Forgotten Places by Travis Elboro, Explore the Places that Time Forgot, The Age of Spectacle by Tom Dykhoff, The Ghost Rider by Philip Roth, a story about a young woman with a vague past, who the character comes to believe is in Frank. Smiley's People by John Le Carre. That's a spy novel. That's the third in the series. The first was Tinker Tailor's Soldier Spy. The Last Library by Freya Sampson. Disclosure by Michael Crichton. Debt of Honor by Tom Clancy. The Big Red Train Ride by Eric Newby. So Obi's original name was A.D. Doug, which definitely seems like a nod to science fiction writer Douglas Adams, the author of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, who cursed every reference to the number 42 in media thereafter. So we learned that O.B. or A.D. Doug has been trying to buy buy his books with cash from bookstores so that later when the bookstores would try to figure out where the book came from to be able to pay the royalties to the publisher, they'd think, oh, maybe we have to order more of this book from this A.D. Doug guy. And then A.D. Doug would finally make some money from all this. It's kind of clever, but yeah, it doesn't work. Sneaky sneak. Now behind the checkout counter, you can see some more books. Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus by John Gray. Overload by Arthur Haley. That's concerning the electricity production industry in California and the activities of the employees and others involved with Golden State Power and Light, which is a fictional California California Public Service Company. Insomnia by Stephen King, where the character can perceive auras and other hidden things. Disclosure by Michael Crichton. And the wind-up Bird Chronicle by Haruki Murakami. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. If you're spending hours at the gym trying to get your body ready for the stress of the holidays, you might want to think about putting the same work into getting your mind ready for the stress of the holidays. And to do that, you'll want to get help from a licensed therapist with BetterHelp. Starting therapy can be hard. The right therapist for you might not be in your area, and some people struggle with the face-to-face -face interaction of therapy. With BetterHelp, you can have your therapy sessions as a phone call, as a video chat, or even via messaging if you prefer that. Whatever's the most comfortable version of therapy for you. Just click the link in the description and answer a few questions about what you're looking for from therapy and what your preferences are. BetterHelp will then match you with the therapist from their network that's right for you. And if you don't really fit with that therapist, which is a common thing with therapy, you can easily switch to a new therapist for no additional cost without stressing about insurance, who's in your network, or anything like that. Mental health is quite the journey, but it is an important one. To start your journey towards better mental health, click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com slash newrockstars to help support this channel and get you 10% off your first month with BetterHelp. So AD goes back to his warehouse in the hills outside Pasadena. Since he's a teacher at Caltech, this structure would probably be part of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which were various facilities around the Pasadena area used to experiment on rocket engines for NASA. Like on one of the shelves are models for NASA space shuttles. This structure was probably part of the JPL's jet engine testing. But this is the same exact room structure of the RNA department of the TVA. It is the same curved shelves, the same overhead pneumatic tube snaking down into a coil like the loom's throughput multiplier. So what is going on? Did AD build the TVA up around this warehouse structure? Or when he got taken into the TVA, did he build his department to look like his old workstation? I think AD Doug was an imaginative sci-fi writer and science professor who was inspired by his own book that was given to him by Loki, and he built the TVA as we know it, starting with this lab. The computers in the TVA all have early 90s black backgrounds because that's the tech 80 had in 1994. So in effect, Loki was the kind of godfather of the TVA. Obi's the one who built it, and then the Kang variant he remains took it over. That's where my theory brain is at this week. We see this close-up of a post-it note board. Oh my god. So we've seen this in the credits of every episode, except there is one new blue post-it that's been added right to the middle that is not there in the credits. It's only in this scene, and this blue note reads right in the middle, who, what, where, when, why, and the who is circled. It's already giving us the answer that Loki later realized at the end of this episode. It's not about where, when, or why. It's about who.
Now, Brandon Barrick was a huge help in identifying these post-it notes. He made a helpful grid with all 112 visible post-it notes labeled. A lot of them are repeated on other notes, but I honestly think these might've been story beats used by head writer, Eric Martin, while they were writing this season of Loki, and it was repurposed as a prop with names and other details swapped out. So here's what it says. We can see Brothers Duel, it has the upper hand, L returns, then, Crossing the Threshold, then The Thorn of Consequences, then Introduction of Amulet, Story Forks at this point. So the amulet could be their code word for He Remains Master Tempad. That could be the nexus point that the finale loops back to in the Citadel. Next post-it note, flashbacks from book one, Dead Lake at the heart of something, then Hex Moment, and this is underlined in red, around PM, a feline creeping up in the shadows, whispers rustling, a buildup, and then an arrow pointing to crescendo, and that's underlined. Next, of the silent mountain, dash and T move forward. One says wrong, unsettled. Next, continuity of ancestral pilgrimage, dark mountains, celestial alignment, fated prophecy, H has an epiphany, tests, Bridge of Worlds, The Broken Heron, which could be a nod to uh, Kate Heron, who directed the season one episodes. A Curse Passed Down Through Generations. Apprehensive, double underlined. Darsh Leaves in the Dead of Night. Monster, Godlike Soul. Lineage Ancestors Traced Back Through Generations. Expansiveness, Deceit, double underlined. Bridge of Worlds, The Broken Heron, again. Allies and Enemies. Death at Amulet's Curse. The Cracking of Water, Ice. He knows. A re-echoed sound, multiple reflections of the same sound. Cracks appear in fabric of grotesque, unhinged, decoy for the hijack. Could the hijack be the hijacking of that flight by D.B. Cooper? H finds out about her parents' captivity. The ground falls from under her feet. A falls. Parallel. Secret of the Dark Mountains, Yorin's betrayal. Capture, kidnapped, parents, what? Circumstances, what if? The Golden Scepter, the Third Moon, Tea Discovery changes everything, which could be a reference to Lamentis. Approach the innermost cave, fear darkness kept in dark, and something crossed out. A falls behind, loses T in the fog. Forest nation, and something crossed out. The broken tree. Her innocence keeps her naive, safe, unbeknownst to her. His feet silent, creeping on the soft moss covered floor. The who, what, where, when, why, and who is circled. Flaxian calendar, lunar. Mortality and grandeur, expansiveness and amplitude. Victory in the wings. The truth, what does the monster represent? Hex moment, Zartan, hidden forts of Zartan, T story parallel with Zartan in book two, the ordeal, arc of the, her is something sensitive, something he feels, something more than pool of deception, vapor traps and lungs, initiates dream state parallax, arrangements having nearly the same energy, dreams is something feels wrong, unsettled, urine unhinged, fear darkness kept in the dark, the reward, paralytic ellipse, apparent ellipse as seen against the background of Secret of the Dark Mountain, the road back of Zartan at the end of quest, a quest journey, obstacles hope, sacrifice, something must be given up, Belladonna, space in valley, the boy betrayed, the tower keeper, navigation, directional, internal, something of viewpoints, switches, flips, perception, seventh world of the serpentine system, book of the something, resonance, reflection, reverberation, the mist follows, pull a deception, B feels like he's sinking, time is slipping, friend is facing away, A was in space in valley, apparitions, darsh, falling, quiet, pensive, softly spoken, dawn at the end, resonance, pool of deception, ancestry, key point. I'm sure this will all make sense after the finale. So AD tells Loki, Of course I believe you. It's a dream come true. One of my characters has come to life and needs my help. This reminds me of what happens in The Sons of Yorin. Yes, so Yorin was a name mentioned on this board. Sons of Yorin is apparently just another fictional book that he wrote, and maybe a lot of these plot points are just made up bullshit for whatever this story is. But for a second, we suspect that everything in the TVA might be taking place in A.D. Doug slash Obi's imagination. Like he's kind of like a Tommy Westfall figure from the St. Elsewhere finale. Or this could be like the 2006 film Stranger Than Fiction, starring Will Ferrell as a guy who realizes he's a character in a novel being written by Emma Thompson's author character. Really? 
I just think that AD Doug has written countless stories about this kind of subject matter so that when Loki finds him, he is exactly the kind of thinker who would turn the TVA into a reality. Now, in the mess of 80s books by the typewriter is the book on black holes that we've seen in the closing credits. OB says that since time traveling in a place like the TVA, which isn't supposed to have time, is still possible to Loki, then traveling back to a place that doesn't exist anymore is equally possible. Doesn't sound like science. No. But it does sound like fiction. Science slash fiction is the title of the episode, but the punctuation doesn't merge the two words together like the literary genre of science fiction, but it puts a slash in between them, making it an either or an or, a choice between looking at things from a scientific perspective or from a fictional perspective. OB says, With science, it's all what and how. But with fiction, it's why. So Loki's why, at least at this point in the episode, is to preserve the TVA to prevent what's coming, he says. But that's not his real selfish why. He can't yet admit that it's not about the why, it's about the who for him. It's about his loneliness. He needs to time slip for someone in order to move. When they approach the chalkboard, hanging on the shelf to the right is a 1922 New York Giants baseball hat. It's the same one worn by Kiwi Kwan as Short Round and Indiana Jones of the Temple of Doom. It's such a sweet Easter egg and something that you can celebrate with another shirt on nerdriot.shop, our indie I love you design. The prod that AD zaps Loki with looks like another piece of technology that could have inspired Victor Timely's design for the time stick. AD Doug deduces that to reunite all the people Loki cares about, he would need the knowledge to build a temp pad, but Loki luckily has that TVA handbook in his coat pocket. So like Renslayer giving Victor Timely the book, Loki gives AD Doug slash OB the book and sets into motion the origin of the original pre-Kang TVA. Loki time slips outside the home of Don slash Mobius. Don has twin sons, Kevin and Sean, played by twins Caleb Johnston Miller and Blake Johnston Miller. There's a rope made of tied bedsheets hanging from one of the upstairs windows. I'm assuming it's Kevin's and that Kevin had snuck out. Don notices an action figure that is burnt and I'm pretty sure that is a TVA Minuteman or a figure meant to look like one. It seems like Don's sons are a bit of a Goofus and Gallus situation. The Goofus being Kevin. Who gave you the matches? I stole them. Kevin is total Sid from Toy Story energy. I'm gonna assume he's actually named after Kevin Feige or Kevin the Robot, because both of them are kind of toy masters who love to play with their toys and then destroy their toys. But I think we can also see these boys as the sons of Odin, two rambunctious boys. You got a longer haired Thor who just breaks everything, but then you also have a calmer, more responsible son who loves snakes, and Loki loves snakes. If you keep them from burning down the house, I'll get you a puppy. And a snake. Mobius tries to sell Loki a watercraft again, and Loki recalls, A beautiful union of form and function. This is how Mobius described jet skis in season one, episode two. There is a beautiful union of form and function which we call the jet ski. If we are learning that Loki truly did inspire the TVA, now I'm wondering if this phrase right now was first put into Mobius's head from this conversation. And surprisingly fast, OB appears through a glitchy time door with a large prototype temp pad. Actually, you can see that he wrote on this device, temporal access device. He says that it took him 18 months. Well, actually 19 months. I had to take a break and move out when I lost my job and my wife left me. Oh no. This speaks to what it takes to be a Kang level inventor. You have to sacrifice all your personal relationships. Loki tells Don to come with him. Your boys won't even know you're gone. Yeah, but I will. All of existence is in grave danger. I don't care. Loki's pretty much learning the lesson he needs to learn this episode. It is about the who. Without our loved ones, we are lost. So Loki reconnects with B-15 slash Dr. Verity Willis and then with Casey slash Frank Morris, who looks like he's just washed up to Angel Island in San Francisco Bay. Judging from the angle of the Golden Gate Bridge behind them, that apparently was the destination of these escapees, according to investigators. But then back at the McDonald's in Broxton, Sylvie's takeout bag spaghettifies as the camera passes it. And you can see in the side view mirror of her truck that the process completes and it is right in front of her face, but it doesn't really phase Sylvie. I think she knows little bits and pieces of her reality are fading like this, but she's okay with it because she's got the amulet, she's got the master temp pad, and I think she thinks she can continue staying a step ahead of this apocalyptic event. That's what she's been doing her entire life after all. This could also explain why Sylvie, unlike the others, remembers Loki. I think her use of that device and her connection to Loki have made them sort of immune from the effects that affect the others. At this bar, there is a Zaniac arcade game. Zaniac Grave. Yeah, this is actually the voice of Brad of Raphael Casal. Remember, his status as a big time actor from the Zaniac film series in the 70s was on the sacred timeline. And if you stick around in this episode all the way to the end of the credits, you can hear his voice again. You die! 
died. Insert your coin, loser. Which kind of feels like a meta nod to us. Like we're dead after watching this episode. He's calling us losers. Loki and Sylvie debate whether restoring the TVA is ethical. You would be ripping people from their lives, showing them something that they cannot unsee. What kind of choice is that? And finally, Sylvie gets what Loki really wants out of this. I want to save everything, all of it. Is it really that hard? Come on, keep trying. I want to save the TVA. Why? I want the TVA back. And? What do you want? I want my friends back. Yeah, it takes the bartender, whose name is Eric, and I wonder if he was named after head writer Eric Martin, because it would take the head storyteller here to break through to Loki to ask him what he wants finally for Loki to give an honest answer. That answer is, he doesn't want to be alone. Loki asks that without his friends, where does he belong? And Sylvie responds, We're all writing our own stories now. It's the deeper theme of this episode, the power of story, controlling one's own narrative. Loki begins this episode poo-pooing the idea of being a writer, but to truly run the TVA, you have to be a playwright. You have to learn the elements of story and transition from the god of mischief into the god of stories. And the god of stories is what Loki becomes when he returns to Verity Willis and the Agent of Asgard run. Behind the scenes photos in the season one writer's room showed that Michael Waldron used Dan Harmon's story circle to structure each episode. And that follows the Joseph Campbell monomyth cycle with eight story beats. You need go, search, find, take, return, change. This episode forced Loki to go back to steps one and two of that cycle. You and need. Who is Loki and what does he need? And this scene ends with what seems like a gag. Sylvie had ordered two shots of bourbon and drinks hers, but when she leaves and Loki reaches for his, it's gone. For a second he thinks, wait, did she just drink both of these? No, no, no. The reality is it's spaghettified away. And if you look at Sylvie's eyeline, she looks down. She saw it happen, but she doesn't care. This also recalls the last time these two got a drink on that train to Sheru in season one, episode three, the whole love is a dagger speech where the object disappeared out of their hands. In the record store Sylvie visits, there's a little monkey toy. Now this is a vintage Japanese toy that normally wears a little green sombrero and strums the guitar and taps his little orange shoes. So just another example of green and orange. Green and orange everywhere, even in this record store. As the camera passes, this monkey on the left is an Edith Piaf record. Edith Piaf, best known for the song Non Je Ne Regrette Rien, or No I Regret Nothing, which is how Sylvie feels now. As much as I love the Velvet Underground, imagine this scene hearing Non Je Ne Regrette Rien. Maybe it'd be too Inception-y, I guess. Now the shop keeps coffee mug reads take me and depicts an alien abduction and from his orange coffee press the mug the couch pillows sylvie's green coat a lot of orange and green he recommends the velvet underground's loaded and sylvie plays the song oh sweet nothing which we should note it's not the first song on this album it is the last song and the guy's take me mug did disappear like an alien abducted it it just spaghettified along with the patron his spilling coffee and everything in the shop and it looks awesome like the song talking about having nothing at all, that is all that is left after this all spaghettifies. But Sylvie is not that worried. She just kind of swipes the temp pad amulet and this orange time door opens and notice how the strands are repelled from that door. So this technology, which the closing credits always end on, really seems to be the master technology that is going to be the key to everything in the finale. It is the amulet. Maybe it's even from ancient Egypt. And that's why she has those onk earrings. I think that Sylvie thought that wherever she was, as long as she had this text, she could stave off any spaghettification effects. But she was wrong, and that spooks her into rejoining Loki. But it's too late. Like the ending of Avengers Infinity War, they all fade one by one with tragic final lines. But I still didn't take it. It was a fiction problem. No, I have to go back to see my boys. There's nowhere left to go. These final words echo in Loki's head as he desperately tries to grab the strands to cling to the pieces of his friends. But then he hears some lines from even earlier from season one, like this. You know where I go, if I could go anywhere. This is what Mobius said right before he got pruned in season one, episode four. You know where I go, if I could go anywhere. And then Loki here also hears this. Do you think that what makes a Loki a Loki? is the fact that we're destined to lose. Sylvie said this to Loki on Lamentis in that same episode. Do you think that what makes a Loki a Loki is the fact that we're destined to lose? Into this line, Loki screams, his mouth going Kirby wide, and then he figures it out. I did it. I controlled it. And Loki explains to Obi. It's not about where, when, or why. It's about who. 
He spins in the room to look at his friends and he realizes he knows how to rewrite the story. And smooth as silk, he's back on the loom observation deck with OB the moment they watched Victor Timely head down to his death. So what happened here? Like Desmond in Lost season four in the constant episode, the one thing that grounds someone who is lost in time is their loved one, their constant. For Desmond, it was Penny. For Cooper in Interstellar, it was his daughter Murph. And for Loki, it's Sylvie and his friends. Why doesn't this include Victor Timely this episode? Well, I think Loki feels a unique kinship with variants who were violently extracted from their histories and forced to work for the TVA as variants, a kind of chaotic confusion you only feel with fellow grunts in the workplace. So Loki, let's go with a science. Science that as guardians like Thor told Jane Foster is just another word for magic and science and magic are two things that cannot be controlled. And Loki instead embraces something that can be controlled, fiction as the God of stories. And every great story begins with the question, who am I? Now throughout the closing credits of this episode, notice how each name has one letter drifting away. The casting director screen shows B-15's confirmation as Verity Willis, Mobius on the sea dew Loki turning around to see himself, OB in his lab, and the mugshots of John Anglin and Clarence Anglin, the directors of this episode, Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead. Now, if you enjoy my approach to movie and TV analysis, we just released what I think is YouTube's most in-depth analysis of John Carpenter's The Thing over on the Deep Dive channel. Please subscribe and watch that video. And again, best way to support us is by grabbing one of these OB We're All Gonna Die shirts at nerdriot.shop. See you at our live show on November 16th in Los Angeles. Subscribe to all three channels of the New Rock Stars Network. Follow me at EA Voss on all social platforms. Big thanks to Brandon Barrick, to Noah Chen, and Gina Ippolito for helping me with this breakdown. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.